Now that we know how to evaluate a definite integral, let's just have a look at some of the little quirks that we can come across, some of the properties of a definite integral. Now, it is possible for an interval to have zero width. And this would happen if the upper and the lower bounds were exactly the same value. So if we're looking at integrals and thinking of them as something that helps us find the area underneath a the curve, then obviously if we're looking at an area that has no space in it at all, then the answer to this will be zero. And that's quite possible. We can also cut up our intervals or dissect them without changing the size of them. So for example, here we've got a shaded area between x equals a and x equals b, it makes sense then that if we use a and b as the upper and lower bounds of f of x dx, then that's exactly the same as if we'd split it up into the area from a to c plus the area from c to b. It'll be exactly the same size. So sometimes you'll see them split up and you'll want to merge them together. Other times you might see them together and you want to split it for some reason. Now functions can also be added and integrated one part at a time. And we've already seen this with our practice. When you're integrating something like, for example, x squared plus 2, or finding the primitive of it, we're finding the primitive of this term and doing our thing with it, and then we're finding the primitive of the other part. And so we know that if we find the primitive of each of them separately, it's the same thing as if we find the primitive of them while they're listed together. So the official way of saying that rule is, if we've got the bounds from a up to b, of f of x dx, and we add the bounds from a to b of g of x, a different function, dx, it's exactly the same, since they've got the same bounds, as finding from a up to b the sum of f of x plus g of x. So that just means that we can write them in together and save ourselves a little bit of time without having two big sets of square brackets. So there's an example here. If we've got x squared plus 2 dx, it would be the same as if we just integrated the x squared and just integrated the two. And that's because the bounds are the same. That's important. The other thing we can do is we can bring constants of the integrand out the front of the integral. So for example here, I've got it written as a rule. From a up to b, our upper and lower bounds, we have k f of x dx. Now the k has to be a number, a constant. It can't be another value of x or it wouldn't work. But if we like, we can take that k and bring it out the front of the entire uh, thing and work out our entire integral and then multiply it by that constant at the end. So an example here, if we're trying to find um, this definite integral, we've got 10x squared dx. To make our lives easier, we can bring the 10 out the front and then go ahead and find the definite integral just of x squared, which is going to be a bit simpler. And then at the end, multiply by our 10. And a couple more tricks, if you like. Intervals can be run in the reverse direction. Now, what this means is that usually we would put our lower uh, bound here, A, down the bottom, and our upper bound, B, up the top. And when we go ahead and find the value of this definite integral, what we do is we find the primitive, capital F of X, and we sub in the upper value first. We find big F of B, and then we subtract big F of A. But if we've switched these around and done them the other way around, what's that going to do? Well, it's going to mean that we're going to have big F of A minus big F of B. And we know that that will give us the exact same number in the end, but with the opposite sign. So if we switch the bounds, we can do that, but we need to just put a negative out the front. And that's working like a big constant out the front of the rest of our working. And the last important point to note here if we have inequalities with integrals, so let's say we've got two functions, f of x and g of x, and we know that within a certain closed interval between a and b, our upper and lower bounds, we can see that f of x is always less than g of x. What would this look like? Well, perhaps our bounds here are a and b, and we have some line here, let's call this y equals um, g of x, and we also have perhaps a parabola sitting down here. This could be y equals f of x. I can see that within this space here, the parabola is sitting below the line throughout that whole region. So I can see there that f of x is indeed lower or less than g of x in value. Now, if I can be sure of that, 
then as I go to evaluate the integrals involved, it makes sense then that the definite interval involving f of x is going to be less than or equal to the definite interval of g of x. Because perhaps it's less than, or it might even come up and touch, it's going to be less than or equal to it.